in the middle-class suburban town of Littleton, near Denver, Colorado. A 17-year-old murderous fantasy is beginning to take shape. He and a friend, known as Vodka, or V, intend to commit an act so violent that it will secure their place in history. Sometime in April next year, me and V will get revenge and kick natural selection up a few notches. If we've learned the art of making time bombs, we'll set hundreds of them around roads, bridges, buildings, and gas stations. Anything that will cause damage and chaos. It'll be like the LA riots, the Oklahoma bombing, World War II, Vietnam, Duke and Doom all mixed together. I want to leave a lasting impression on the world. One year later, on April the 20th, 1999, Eric Harris and another Columbine student, Dylan Klebold, committed the worst high school massacre in American history. They killed 12 students and one teacher, injured 23 others, and then turned the guns on themselves. This film records events as they unfolded on that Tuesday morning during the critical hour between 11.08 a.m. and 12.08 p.m. For years, the horror of the massacre has defied explanation. But recently, new information has been released about the attack and the events leading up to it. From these terrible details, it's possible to reconstruct a fuller picture of Columbine and the freakish whirlwind of circumstances that ended with two teenagers committing mass murder. Eleven oh eight in the morning, and Eric Harris is three minutes away from Columbine. NBK came quick. Everything I see and hear, I relate to NBK somehow. Feels like a goddamn movie sometimes. NBK is Eric and Dylan's code name for the coming massacre. It stands for Natural Born Killers, a movie they both admire. The film tells the story of Mickey and Mallory. Two mass murderers with traumatized childhoods who become media celebrities. For Eric and Dylan, the movie seems to represent a kind of redemption that they, like the fictional characters, are ultimately superior. I know we're gonna have followers because we're so fucking godlike. I mean, we're not exactly human. We have human bodies, but we've evolved one step above you, fucking human shit. I mean, we actually have fucking self-awareness. A key element in Eric and Dylan's sense of alienation comes from their school. I hate you people for leaving me out of so many fun things. And no, fucking don't say, well, that's your fault, because it isn't. You people had my phone number, and I asked and all. But no, don't let the weird Eric kid come along. Oh, fucking no. Columbine High School's unspoken hierarchy. Eric and Dylan see themselves at the bottom of the pile. The weird kids who hang out with the other outcasts. At the very top are the jocks. A group with their own rules of conduct and their own dress code, which includes white baseball caps. Jocks are not necessarily athletes. A jock is anyone who believes that they because they wear nice clothes, because they screw the best looking girl, because the teachers treat them different, deserve and are better than everyone else. Although Eric and Dylan will not target the jocks in their shooting rampage, witnesses will later report that they both seem hell-bent on revenge against the school itself. They went to Columbine High School to kill people. They didn't go shoot up the police station. They didn't go to the public library. And that's because they hated this school. They hated the injustice of this school. They hated the environment. And, and I am not in any way condoning what they did. or I'm just trying to find the answers. You've given us shit for years. 
you're fucking gonna pay for all the shit. We don't give a shit. Because we're gonna die doing it. At 11.09 a.m., the cafeteria at Columbine is just starting to fill with students on their lunch break. At some point earlier that morning, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold planted two 20-pound propane bombs in the cafeteria. Both bombs were set to explode at 11.17, just as the cafeteria reaches the peak of the lunchtime rush. The plan was to kill as many students as possible in the explosions and to execute survivors. The bomb planting was not caught on the cafeteria surveillance cameras, possibly because of a tape change. That morning, I believe it was third hour philosophy class. I know it was philosophy class. We had a big test on Chinese philosophy. And Eric was always type A about his grades. Um, he wouldn't ditch class if there was a test or an assignment due. So it really struck me that Eric wouldn't show up that day. When we got to fourth hour that day, though, he still wasn't in class. And I'm, even I only ditched one class in a row, usually. Um, and Dylan wasn't there either. Another Columbine student is 17-year-old John Savage. He's just completed a music class. I got to school early, um, did some homework. You know, it's just one of those days that you don't expect anything to happen. We just finished up string orchestra. I was trying to decide whether or not to, 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 to practice at, at like way back in the back of the school in the band room or go to the library. Among the teachers on duty is Dave Sanders. He's a popular sports coach in the school because of his ability to get the best out of the least likely athletes. Patty Nielsen is a 35-year-old teacher working part-time at the school. Normally she heads home after her morning art classes. But today, she's been assigned to monitor the hallways, which are just starting to fill with hundreds of students heading for lunch in the cafeteria. After creative writing, every day, I'd go out for my smoke, uh, and so I took my same route I do every day. I'd go out for smoke, walk around. Except this day I saw Eric pull in. Since he had missed two hours of school, I went up to see what was going on. And I called him a few names, and he laughed, called me a few names back, and we had this little interchange where I was cussing him out, basically. Which is really weird that he didn't shoot me for that. But I cussed him out. Eric, filmed here, and Brooks have had a tempestuous history. A year earlier, Brooks found his name on Eric's website. Eric was threatening to kill him. There was information on there that Eric was building pipe bombs, detonating pipe bombs, and said that essentially he wanted to kill Brooks Brown. Brooks's parents reported Eric's threat to the police. This was not the first time Eric's name had been brought to the attention of the police in the two years before the shootings. But they were unable to access Eric's website and mislaid paperwork related to the complaint. If they'd acted on these claims, Eric would have been in jail. It's very simple. 
and Columbine never should have happened. In the meantime, Brooks Brown had made his own peace with Eric. It probably saved his life. What the hell is wrong with you, man? You weren't in third hour. You missed the test. It doesn't matter anymore. And then he looked at me. I, I said, dude, you missed the huge test. He said, it didn't matter anymore. And then he looked at me and he said, uh, Brooks, I like you now. Get out of here. Go home. Go home. Okay. There's a lot of theories about why he didn't shoot me. I personally think, because I remember the look on his face, he didn't want to kill me. And I wasn't the only person who let go of that jet. John Savage, actually. Um, I was friends with him. Screech, he was a great guy. John Savage has decided to revise for his history test in the library, where the worst of the Columbine massacre will take place. Eric and Dylan have arrived with a huge arsenal of weapons. After the attack, the police would count two sawn-off shotguns, two 9mm guns, and 99 bombs, including the two 20-pound propane bombs in the cafeteria and booby trap bombs in each of their cars. They have spent a year gathering these weapons, a year planning a massacre intended to wipe the school off the map. Just a month before the attack, an unreleased videotape reveals the extent of Eric and Dylan's preparation. This is a reconstruction from reports of the tape's contents. The cameraman is Dylan, the location, Eric's bedroom. Eric reveals dozens of hiding places, containing what amounts to a small armaments factory. How did Eric succeed in concealing such a vast collection of lethal weaponry? The question still remains unanswered. Eric's parents have not spoken publicly since the massacre. Hi, Mom. <laughs> but his play acting at the end of the tape shows that Eric is well aware of his skills in the art of deception. It'll be the most nerve-wracking 15 minutes of my life. And after the bombs are set, we're waiting to charge to the school. Seconds will be like hours. God, I can't wait. In a far corner of a school parking lot, Neil Gardner is taking a quick lunch with Andy Martin, a Columbine security guard. Gardner is a local police officer with special responsibility for the school's students and teachers. In the past, he's seen Dylan Klebold around the school, but he doesn't know Eric Harris, and he does not appear to know that Eric and Dylan have already been in trouble with the police and the courts. Fifteen months earlier, they'd broken into a van and stolen electrical equipment. They were later arrested on felony charges of criminal trespass and theft. At their court hearing, both were ordered to undergo courses designed to steer juveniles away from crime. After completing his course, Eric seemed contrite. I am happy to say that with the help of this class and some other diversion-related experiences, I do want to try and control my anger. Eric's private journal tells a different story. Isn't America supposed to be the land of the free? How come if I'm free, I can't deprive some fucking dumb shit of his possessions if he leaves them in the front seat of his fucking van, in plain sight, in the middle of fucking nowhere, on a fry fucking day night? Natural selection. Fuckers should be shot. Their encounter with the law reveals the existence of a kind of parallel universe. While outwardly apologetic and reformed, Eric and Dylan were now bonded by a shared rage. My wrath from January's incident will be godlike. Not to mention our revenge in the commons. 
The Commons is the Columbine cafeteria. Eric and Dylan have drawn up detailed plans for the attack. The bombs are set to explode in one minute's time. There are 480 students inside, almost a quarter of the school's population. Richard Castaldo is on his way out to meet his friend, Rachel Scott. They plan to have lunch just outside the school's west entrance. In their trench coats, Eric and Dylan attract little attention. They've often worn this uniform to school. The attack is now just seconds away. When I first sat down you know, to eat my, eat my lunch, I saw, you know, I saw a couple of guys come off to my left, and they threw a, uh, they threw some. I didn't know what it was at the time, but they threw it was a pipe bomb, and it, I remember it, it went off and it didn't really do anything. And I thought, at first, I just kind of thought they were. You know, screwing around because you know, I, was, I guess like a senior prank or something because school was about to end. Go, go, go. I guess it hit Rachel first, but not by you know, just by like half a second or something. So I kind of remember seeing that out of the corner of my eye and just. Kind of brace myself, I guess, and then. When I first started hearing gunshots, um, I didn't really think in my head they were gunshots. You generally don't. You don't go, oh, well, that's a pistol. And it never really occurred to me that they were gunshots until I started hearing shotgun blasts and an explosion. So I started running. First thought that entered my mind is I should call. My dad. Brooks called me and, and he said, Dad, there's a shooting at the school. And instantly I knew it was Eric. I saw, him throw, I saw him throw a couple grenades on the roof and they exploded. And then I saw him shooting guns down towards the parking lot. Inside the school, no one's sure what's going on. Some think it's just a prank by senior students. Dave Sanders realizes it might be much more serious. Neil, I need you in the lunchroom urgently. Neil Gardner receives a panicked radio message from inside the school, but he thinks at first that it might be no more than an accident on the school grounds. someone shooting outside. I want you quiet. I want you to all make your way outside this way only. Within seconds, Dave Sanders and two other Columbine staff members have evacuated most of the cafeteria. Eric and Dylan's bombs are now due to explode, but fail to detonate. As the injured Sean Graves makes an attempt to reach safety inside the cafeteria, he's aware of one of the gunmen coming up behind him. He plays dead. Dylan arrives to find the cafeteria apparently empty. There are no easy targets. Where's everyone 
Dave Sanders now embarks on a determined attempt to secure as much of the school as possible. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Even if they come in, stay very still, okay? He will spend the next two minutes running through the hallways and classrooms, doing all he can to make sure students have some form of protection. In a science lab on the upper floor of the school, 17-year-old Aaron Hansi is completing a homework project. It was a lunchtime. It wasn't a regular class. But within a few minutes, you started hearing things, and it was kind of weird because you didn't usually hear those type of sounds. And then you started feeling the, the floor move or the walls move. Just really curious at that point because I had no idea what was going on. But shortly after, when the teacher came in, then we found out what was going on. Everybody get down behind your workbenches. I'm going to lock the door so The teacher came in, in and informed us that people were shooting inside the school and to get down behind the workstations. He informed us that he was locking the doors. We can leave. They were fine. You can go through them, but you can't come in. This is what we always wanted to do. This is awesome. Let's do it. Neil Gardner is the first police officer on the scene. Code 33, shots fired. Gardner believes momentarily that he may have hit one of the gunmen. The end of the gun battle with Gardner marks the beginning of Eric and Dylan's attack inside the school. Well, the first thing that I really remember was when a lady came running into the library and, and she said, everybody get under the tables, there's a kid out there with a gun. You know, that was my first, like, oh, man, something's going down. Get down. Everybody, get down. <laughs> get under the tables. I think everyone was just kind of too shocked to actually do anything. You know, they were still trying to figure out. And then, like, she said it a second time, like, get under the tables. And then people started to respond. First, actually, I thought it was just some, like, random person that came in off the street and, you know, just like some crazy maniac or something. It didn't even like click at, at that time that it could have been a student because you know, I didn't think anyone at Columbine would like start shooting people. Oh! Yeah. I just kind of sat and waited, you know. I, I guess I was just hoping I wasn't going to die, really. Jefferson County 911. Yes, I am a teacher at Columbine High School. There is a student here with a gun. He has shot out a window. I believe one student uh, um, shot um, me. I've been Columbine High School. I, I don't know what's in my shoulder. If it was just who last week who what. Um, okay, has anybody been injured, ma'am? Yes. Who is the student, ma'am? I do not know who the student is. Okay. We've got help on the way, ma'am. Oh, 
make sure the science labs are locked. Day Sanders is still trying to clear the hallways. Five more police units are nearing the school. Dave Sanders is badly injured. The killing spree inside the school is about to begin. Columbine student Aaron Hansi is still hiding in a science room when one of his teachers returns, trying to find anyone who knows first aid. Yeah. I told him I did, and then just made a mad dash across the hallway. Bombs were still exploding, guns were still being fired. They could come around the corner anytime. Dave Sanders has crawled out of the hallway and collapsed in a nearby science room. He's in desperate need of medical attention. And then we went through the back doors into the corner science room where I found Dave Sanders. Mr. Sanders? It's okay, we're here to help you. It's Aaron. The paramedics are on their way. When I first got to Dave, he was conscious, fully aware of what was going on. So when we got to him, he was on his stomach. I thought he had been shot with a shotgun or something, and just in the chest at close range or something like that. We're going to push you a little bit on your back here. One, two, three. Aaron quickly discovers okay. that Dave Sanders has an entry wound okay. in are each shoulder. Uh, yes. When I looked over the situation, it... it yeah, he'd been shot, and that's no small cookie, but he was conscious, and he was very aware of his surroundings. He's doing great. You're doing, you're doing great, Mr. Sanders. Teacher Teresa Miller tries calling 911, but the lines are constantly busy. Help is on the way, don't worry. I thought we were going to be able to take him out, and that he could get fixed, get operated on if needs be, and, and recover. By now, there are six police units outside the school. Some are tending to frightened and injured students around the parking lots. Others are securing a perimeter. Following standard police procedures, which emphasize the need to contain an incident, none of the officers ventures into the school to try to challenge the killers. In the next seven minutes, Eric and Dylan will carry out the most brutal part of their assault on the school, the attack on the 56 students and staff hiding in the library. Get up! Everybody with white hats, stand up! This is for all the shit you've given us for the past four years! They said, everyone get out, we're gonna blow up the library. And then I thought, oh, well, maybe they just wanna blow up the library is like a statement, you know, maybe they don't actually want to hurt anybody. So I kind of, like, I, I thought about, like, maybe just getting up and, and leaving and letting them, like, blow up a bunch of books. But then, like, no one else got up, so I was like, oh, maybe I'll just stay. Fine, I'll start shooting anyway! After they walked about halfway through into the library was when they came into my view. And then I could see that it was actually people that I knew, students. You know, it was just these two people that I thought were just ordinary, regular kids were suddenly like blowing things up and shooting. And I was like, what are they doing? Let's go kill some cops. Shoot us! Right now. 
quit your bitching. Die, huh? Well, we're all gonna die. We're gonna blow up the school anyway. I said, said something about like, like, oh look, it's it's the little nigger or or something like that, and um, I, I knew who they were talking about. Grab. There's a nigger over here. <coughs> Come on. And then I, I, I heard some more banging, you know, gunshots. I can't believe I just did that. Cool. I, I, I kind of assumed that they'd shot him, but like, you know, like I couldn't see, so I was, I guess, kind of hoping for the best. Ready to die next? Aaron Hansi is now struggling to keep Dave Sanders conscious. With the help of a teacher and another student, as well as his father who's phoning in first aid advice from home, Aaron uses family pictures from Dave Sanders' wallet to keep him talking. I think it really did help him with the pictures because we could get away from how are you feeling, where does it hurt, um, get away from the pessimistic side of things and try to be optimistic and to, to see the things he did love. Listen up, you fucking scared pieces of shit! This school is fucking dead! I'm in the back. I got some smoke coming from the building. Uh, I'm over here with, uh, unit. The phone line left open by Patty Nielsen records the sound of the killings in the library. Okay. During uh, the shooting, you can hear Dylan saying all kinds of things to people before he kills them um, that Eric doesn't. I mean, there's a very distinct difference between how the two handled the shooting that day. And it's, it's incredibly difficult to listen to, um, even if you don't know the people they're killing and who's killing them. I could like see his boots coming towards me through the rows of bookshelves, and I was like, "Wow, this is it!" You know, you know. And I was like, "Man, this like I could die here." It was it was pretty shocking, I guess. Who's under there? Identify yourself. And I said, "It's John," because you know I I kind of knew him a little, and I was hoping he'd like remember that that I wasn't a, a jock, and that I'd you know. <clears throat> Tried to treat him with respect and stuff. John Savage? 
Yeah. Hey, Dylan. What are you doing? I'm just killing people. Oh. It was just creepy. Um, and then so I, I looked up at him and I said, are you going to kill me? And he said, what? You know, because the fire alarms and everything. So I, I asked louder, are you going to kill me? Are you going to kill me? No, nah, man, just get out of here. Just run. Run. Run! As the killings go on unchecked in the library, the police presence outside continues to build. Gunshots from the library are clearly heard and reported by officers outside, who are just tens of meters away. The police now also have good descriptions of Eric and Dylan. But no officers will enter the school for another half an hour. Later, the police will say they'd received conflicting reports of a sniper on the roof and that there were as many as eight gunmen. Also, communications problems made coordination ever more difficult. And one of the things the police don't want you to know about that day is that on April 20th, while the executions are taking place, while these innocent children are being murdered in the library, the outside library door is propped open and the policemen that are standing by their cars on the lawn outside are listening to these children be murdered. And they listen and they listen and they never rescue them and they let them be murdered. And no matter what they say, that's not acceptable. And when they talk about how they saved many kids that day, that's not true. Those kids saved themselves that came out of that school. They saved themselves. And as an example, Lisa Kreutz, uh, a girl who was shot and lay on the floor in and out of consciousness, bleeding, and they rescued her, they rescued her, they got to her at about 3.45 in the afternoon and she was still alive. Um, she was just lucky she didn't bleed to death. I was actually scared that they might change their minds, so I ran as fast as I could in case they decided to turn around and shoot me in the back. people that'd be more fun I guess really it made you realize how short life is you know when you're young it seems like it's gonna like go on forever and you got plenty of time you don't have forever the seven minute killing spree in the library comes to a sudden end just before 11:36. Even though Dylan now confronts one of the school's athletes, the injured Evan Todd, he threatens and abuses, but doesn't kill. Do you want to go to the commons? I have one more thing to do. He now seems reduced to a gesture of repressed rage. By the time Eric and Dylan leave the library, 12 students in the school are dead, one teacher is dying, and 23 others are injured, many of them seriously. There has been no pattern to the attack. Not one of their victims has been singled out because he or she is a figure of hate. There 
are still hundreds of students and teachers hiding elsewhere in the school. At one point, when Teresa was still on the phone and she was looking outside the door, trying to see what was going on, she saw the shooters come down the hall. They reloaded their firearms right there in front of our classroom. Door had a window in it, and so they could look right in. I remember just jumping away. It was a scary, that was probably one of the most scariest points of the whole ordeal, just because they were right there. I heard from you, but I can tell you. Is he still conscious? He is, Dave Sanders. His name is Dave Sanders. Dave Sanders, okay. I found out the next morning that Dave had died. It came as a as a big shock because I thought we could take him out and he could go get operated on and, and start the recovery process. I guess it broke my heart to, to think that he did die because I tried my best. Eric and Dylan's movements through the school now seem directionless. Eric's secret journals and video recordings leave the clear impression of a disturbed mind, filled with grandiose and destructive schemes. Dylan, however, is a mystery. Would Dylan be a part of it? I couldn't imagine it. But could he be caught up in it in some way? Yes. And I think Eric was dominant over Dylan. I do believe that I had a, that conversation with Dylan's mother after the shootings, that Dylan was always trying to be there for Eric and actually take care of them because Eric didn't have as many friends. Dylan had friends, people liked Dylan. When Eric and I first met, and for a considerable amount of time thereafter, I got no hint that he had this other side to him, um, that he was this angry. I don't think he was at the time. Um, this would have been freshman and sophomore year. I don't think. For freshman year, he was that angry. He was on the soccer team. Uh, he was hanging out with us. We were doing all kinds of stuff. Um, he didn't nearly have the simmering anger that he did later on, by any means. I think he was a different person. Columbine changed me. I, I know it changed him, obviously. Um, but I don't think he was nearly as psychotic as he turned out to be. We hate niggers, spicks, and especially white shit. We hate... Anyone who hates Asians, Mexicans, or anyone of a different race just because they're different. You know what I hate? Star Wars fan. Get a friggin' life. Boring geek. You know what I hate? People who drive slow and fast lane. God, people do not know how to drive. Eric tries to detonate one of the 20 pound propane bombs in the cafeteria. It is perhaps his first suicide bid during the attack. Get pretty radioactive. In the months before, Eric had been prescribed an antidepressant drug called Zoloft, which is commonly used to treat obsessive compulsive disorder. But his condition just seemed to get worse. And he was on Zoloft for six weeks, and he reported that he was both having homicidal and suicidal ideation. That's where you constantly think about hurting yourself or hurting someone else. And he did realize it was coming from the medication, and so did the doctors. They took him off the medication. But all he got in exchange was a different brand name. He got Luvox. At Eric Harris's autopsy, therapeutic quantities of Luvox were discovered in his bloodstream.
Dylan Klebold's autopsy report found no traces of drugs. Was Eric's medication one further element in the Columbine tragedy? Or was it an underlying psychiatric condition that the drugs were supposed to treat? One thing is certain. When Eric's father heard of the shooting, he immediately thought it could be his son. In the three years before Columbine, there had been ten incidents of American teenagers carrying out gun attacks on their school. In none of these did more than five people die. But Eric and Dylan set out to kill hundreds. Every aspect of their lives has been examined in the search for a single cause that explains how they could carry out a massacre with such premeditation and cold ruthlessness. But perhaps the answer is that there is no single cause. That Eric and Dylan were created by a kind of perfect storm of circumstances that gave them the means and the opportunity to carry out an outrageous act of teenage terrorism. And this was compounded by omissions and oversights by police, parents, doctors and the school. The perfect storm theory for no one stopping them works exquisitely. There were a million times someone could have stepped in. Uh, the, there were hundreds and hundreds of times the police themselves legally could have stopped them, uh, could have searched, could have stopped them, could have gone and talked to the parents. Uh, there were times the parents could have stepped in and said, hey, I'm searching your room. Oh, look, 25 pipe bombs. Gee, something's wrong with you. Um, there were a million times it could have been stopped. As midday approaches, Eric and Dylan make their final journey back towards the library. A six-man police SWAT team is about to enter the school, but from an entrance at the far end of the building. The police will sweep through the school, room by room, and will reach the library, last of all, almost three and a half hours later. Since Columbine, the local police have reviewed their tactics on what they call imminent threats. Officers responding to shooting incidents are now trained to intervene early. Eric and Dylan arrive back at the library door. The terrible sights of death are shrouded in thick smoke. They will make one last near suicidal gesture before ending their lives just a few meters from many of their victims. Eric and Dylan's own home recorded videotapes carry a fearful warning. <laughs> but few could have imagined that they would turn fantasy into tragedy. <laughs> Worthless piece of crap! Entry exit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, not fucking out. Okay, what's, what do you got for a name? 